Hello, friends. Welcome to the latest episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I'll be uh, discussing today all sorts of Quranic and late antiquity matters with a really extraordinary scholar, Dr. Ahab Bedoui of Leiden University. We'll focus in a bit on the question of pagans. Were there really still pagans around at the time of the Quran's proclamation? What do the evidence or what does the evidence of Quranic inscriptions say about these pagans and how can that be balanced against the evidence of the Quran itself, what the Quran says about the mushrikun or the associators or uh, pagans, of course, I'll speak a little bit about that word pagan, which is uh, complicated, but it'll all be clear by the end of this uh, episode. So thank you for joining. Please um, support us, uh, not financially. We're not looking for any financial support, I promise, but just by subscribing to this channel, spreading the news, um, liking the channel will really help uh, and uh, share the news about exploring the Quran and the Bible with all of your friends and everyone else. Thank you. Hello, Professor Ahab Bedawi. Nice to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. It's great uh, to have a chance to speak with you about your work and some questions about formative Islam, um, about the Quran, and also uh, the Quranic pagans or mushrikun and the debates surrounding them. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So. Thank you so much. Well, I thought I, I would start with a, a semi-formal introduction and... Um, uh, I have your, your bio here and um, some, some of your works, but feel free to add or correct me if I get something wrong here. So friends, Dr. Ahab Bedoui studied at the universities of London and Exeter and received his PhD in Arabic and Islamic intellectual history from the University of Exeter in 2014. He spent three years as a lecturer in Islamic and Iranian intellectual history at the University of St. Andrews. And then uh, he was uh, here in the States in 2016 at the College of William and Mary. And since then has been um, assistant professor of formative and post-classical Islamic thought at Leiden University. He's also a member of the Leiden University Center for the Study of Islamic Society and founder of the Leiden University Shia Studies Initiative. Uh, among the works, there's too many to mention and to uh, keep things brief enough so we could get on to business. Um, but he is the editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Shia Islam. He has a monograph uh, forthcoming entitled Echoes of Late Antiquity and Early Islam, I think with Cambridge University Press. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. And is working on a second monograph entitled Monotheism and Paganism in Late Antique Arabia, the Quran and Beyond. Generally, um, Professor uh, Bedoui works on early formative Islamic thought, but also medieval Islamic intellectual tradition. How do I do? Should I add something? Did I get something wrong there? No, no, that's perfectly it's just just worth saying that the Oxford Handbook is co-edited um, with, with Professor St. That's all. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, thank you. And you have a, a couple of contributions I saw in there, one on questions of uh, Quranic variants. I think that's with Marijn van Putin. Yeah, so I have a chapter co-authored with um, Dr. Marijn van Putin on, on the Shia Qiraat, um, the variants of the Quran. And I have another independent chapter on Shiism under the Umayyads and Abbasids, where I specifically look at how the early Shi conception of God and revelation developed uh, under, under that period. Great. Terrific. Well, I, I, I'd like to start by just um, uh, giving you an opportunity to speak a, a little bit biographical, although we don't have to get into to great detail, but especially in terms of your academic work, how you entered in the field of um, early medieval Islamic studies, uh, how you ended up here. So yeah, what, what would you say to that? Uh, well, thank you so much um, for, for this kind invitation. And, and I very much look forward to this uh, friendly and um, informal chat, but we, we can sort of um, be formal every now and then, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but briefly and informally, um, not many people know this, but my first undergraduate degree was in physics and mathematics um, at the University of London. Um, except that that sort of, I entered university as an undergrad six or seven days after 9-11. Um, and as you can imagine, if you look like me and you come from the same background as me, it's difficult not to uh, be dragged into the conversation about Islam and violence and, and, and the Quran and, anything to do with, with Muslim religiosity or history or ideas. 
um, was a topic that was often discussed and, and, and vociferously um, on campus, uh, campus life um, in the days and the weeks, even in the two or three years after 9-11 mm -hmm. was, was sort of replete with, with semi-intelligent discourses mm -hmm. um, about Islam among students, with, with professors uh, and so on. Uh, I remember my first, first few days at um, King's College, uh, the University of London, um, I was sort of confused, curious, and I was roaming around. And I went to the Christian chapel just to see sort of the interior, which is quite wonderful. Um, and I saw at least 15, 16, maybe more stickers, um, you know, things you sort of pin on, on the wall by students. And these sort of include petition, uh, petitionary prayers and, and, and things like that. But at least 15 or 16 of this, because I remember I counted at a time because I reported it, um, were full of strongly worded, vile messages, uh, sort of denounced Islam and, and you know, imprison them, kill them, kick them out, send them back to Pakistan or India or the usual. Um, and that was perhaps my first ever experience of palpable, in your face, uh, forms of Islamophobia. And, right. and I thought I realized at the time that you know, this is, this is quite serious. Um, before 9-11, um, Islam in, in the public sphere was, was quite inconspicuous, rarely acknowledged, rarely sort of discussed. But now is only a phase. And obviously I come from a, a Muslim background um, and, and it was very confusing time for someone like myself. Um, um, and because of that, um, I, I began to delve uh, into sort of all aspects of, of, of the Islamic or Muslim learned tradition. Uh, I read philosophy, I read history, I read hadith studies. Um, um, this is as an undergraduate, sorry to jump in, but you were still pursuing math and physics and- Yeah, I was, I was still doing math and physics, um, but, and of course I had always, you know, had a, a sort of like a cursory grasp of, of, of Islam and, 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 and what have you. I, I was born and raised in, in, uh, in Iraq, um, so naturally, I, I was sort of exposed to a number of uh, 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 public manifestations of Islam, but now I sort of delve into it. I went to the library and, and picked up books, and, and I read, uh, and I read quite a lot. Um, and I thought, wow, this is this is quite fascinating because the academic literature I had read um, had presented a sort of a completely new way of, of seeing this religion, of, of the ideas associated with this religion, of the text. Um, and I decided, I think, by my second or, or sort of late first year undergrad, that I wanted to do this for a career. This is it. This is where I want to sort of end right. up. Right. Um, and as soon as I completed uh, my degree, uh, I enrolled for a BA, another undergraduate degree in Middle Eastern Studies. Um, at the University of Exeter, and it was there that I, I became acquainted with some of the sort of great names, which are still around today. Um, and yeah, that, that sort of, you know, the rest is history. Mm. Um, after the BA, I, I did my uh, graduate degrees and, and I received a PhD. Um, and did, I sort of had a very, sorry. I was going to ask about your uh, you, so you, you spoke probably um, Iraqi Arabic uh, at, at home, yes. did you? Yes. And yep. uh, uh, did you also have a, a good grasp of uh, classical Arabic already, or did you need um, to do it? <laughs> Well, I, I think it would be dishonest to say I did. Um, I, I didn't. I, I, like, I suppose many native Arabic speakers, um, we could very easily read a classical text um, and, and fathom a good portion of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was honest enough to, to realize that I needed training and, and, and I needed to immerse myself um, in, in some you know, serious, rigorous training um, that allowed me to sort of make sense and decipher classical Arabic texts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I sort of started that. Um, and, and I managed to sort of find a couple of teachers um, to, to help me with this. Um, traditional uh, teachers, you know, those who sort of saw themselves as instructors in classical Arabic and, and, and what have you. Um, because it's quite difficult, I think, to do that at undergraduate studies, even postgraduate studies. Yes. yes. Um, and yes, yeah, so I, I, I did the PhD. That was great fun. Um, and 
my so my my post PhD journey was a bit odd as well, because I was hired by St Andrews University while still a PhD student. Um, I was hired to sort of lecture on medieval uh, Islamic and Iranian history, um, and that that was a, a fascinating experience. But in the first I suppose year or so was was quite odd, um, because. At the back of my mind, I was still a PhD student, but now here I am in the classroom, lecturing, facing students, marking exams, setting essays and, 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 and what have you. And it took me a while to make that transition from PhD mode to university lecture mode. Yes. Um, I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> my recommendation is get your PhD, this spend your PhD? a year or two in a postdoctoral position um, and then lecture. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. And do do you still read any math or physics just out of curiosity? No, 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 no. Yeah. I That's mean, in the past. Uh, That's the distant past. You know, you, you, it's it's something you can show off when when with friends you pretend you have a, a, a half decent grasp of you know complex mathematical formula, but in reality, I really don't. Um, I sometimes try to make analogies when I'm teaching undergraduates here at Notre Dame in regard to theological questions and the problem of knowledge and uncertainty and things like this. And uh, I, I try to make analogies with, with physics, in both particle physics and sort of cosmic physics. And I, I, I think I always get it wrong. I can see sometimes undergraduates actually shaking their heads like, what is this guy doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should probably stop him, so. Well, no, you, you keep going. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever had to rely on my undergraduate training in my academic sort of mm -hmm. uh, uh, career as, as a scholar of Islam. Um, there were ones, you know, a few times. Um, so as, as you know, one of my fascinations and, and areas of, of specialization is uh, medieval Arabic philosophy. Um, so there were a few times when I delved into Arabic translations of, of uh, Aristotle, Aristotelian right. physics. Right. I thought, oh, okay, that, that makes sense when you study things like motion and, and, and related concepts. Um, so it wasn't a complete waste of time, um, but the mathematics is, is, is fascinating. And again, it, it did help me um, sometimes um, when I have to give undergraduate lectures um, on Islam and science, you know, sort of introductory general lectures we all have to do. Right, right. Excellent, excellent. Was there a, uh, you mentioned having, having good teachers along the way. Uh, are, is there one or more scholars or maybe one or more books during your uh, graduate training uh, that had a lasting impact on you? Oh, uh, that's a difficult one. Um, so in terms of early Islam um, and formative Islamic religious and intellectual history, um, I don't use the term origins of Islam. I think it's a very problematic term. Mm. I despise mm. it, but sometimes you know, you're forced into that corner. So on the origins of Islam or early Islam. Can I ask uh, about that? What, what's, what's wrong with the origins of Islam as a term? <laughs> well, it has to do with, so Vanes, who's of course one of the figures, one of the sort of scholars that stands out in terms of influence and inspiration on the way I see things and interpret the past. Um, Vanes is, is just Vanes is, is up there, perhaps the, the single most influential scholar uh, on my work. Um, so Vanus, maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, had a very interesting interview um, in German, I think, where he was asked about this term, the origins of Islam. And he said it's, it's problematic for a number of reasons. Chief among them is the fact we assume that there was a singular point in time where a Big Bang moment from which Islam emerged, from which Islam sort of proceeded, emanated. Um, whereas in reality, the evidence seems to suggest, and this is Van Es uh, talking, that there were multiple Islams, which after a while converged towards a unity. So from multiplicity to unity, rather than the prevalent sort of orthodoxy, unity to multiplicity. Um, there were many localized traditions, um, sure, there was sort of a, a common thread that tied them all together, perhaps things like prayer and commitment to God and, 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 and the supremacy of the Quran as a revelation. Um, but there were sort of localized in the legal traditions, perhaps even in the theologies and outlook. And then there was a movement towards unity around the ninth century and Gregorian, 
Um, so to, to speak of a, a, an origins of Islam is to, to make a number of uh, assumptions which haven't been demonstrated. One, that there was this um, singular epoch in history where you can locate, pinpoint exactly where Islam came from. Um, and I find that problematic. As an intellectual historian, as a historian of ideas, uh, I find that laughable, in fact, because we know ideas are not stable, ideas mutate, ideas develop, um, and ideas take a while before they settle or, or ossify. Um, so this is why I, I sort of reject the term. That's very well put, um, very well put, very interesting, okay. Um, and how did we get, so in terms of influence on, yes. on the origins of Islam or early Islam, Joseph Van Es, most certainly, his, his ability to reconstruct ideas and theologies and worldviews from fragments, from fragmentary sources is just, just remarkable. Mm. This and is the, the German scholar, I think, at, at Tübingen, most of his yeah. career wrote a multi-volume work on theology and society in German. Yeah, that's subsequently a six-volume six work, um, Theology and Society, which has been translated, I think, mm -hmm. four volumes have been translated recently by Grill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and that really is, is it's mind-boggling how learned he is um, in that work and in person. And, and I, that really I, is an inspiration. I remember um, I was in a seminar in my own doctoral work with Dmitry Gutas, who worked on yeah. Greco-Arabic, so the translation movement, very well known for his scholarship on that. And uh, he was introducing us to Vanessa's work, Theology and Society, which was then only in German, they were like and Gesellschaft. And he was like, sorry, folks, but you still have to learn German because yeah, of yeah. Vaness. It's his fault. <laughs> I, I know an, a number of people who learn German specifically to read, to read this. Joseph Vaness. And, and, and that was possibly one of the reasons why I sort of constantly kept working on my German to be able to read him, to read him in the original. Um, but, you know, he's, it's not an easy read. I mean, even, even those who have a, a you know, decent German Right. Um, other influential scholars, um, undoubtedly on, on early Islam, Patricia Crone. Um, I feel that I learn something new every time I read her works. Um, her ability to interrogate the sources um, and arrive at conclusions dispassionately is, is, is something that I admire uh, immensely. Um, her grasp of the sources, the literature, a range of literatures in, in sort of history, hadith, theologies, philosophies, uh, biographies is, is quite impressive. Um, in terms of, I suppose, medieval Shiism, one of the other areas I work on, uh, or this early Shi Islam, um, I would say Amir Muazzi, um, I'm sure you know him. Yes. Um, he has been instrumental um, in, in sort of reviving interest in Shia Islam. Mm. Um, of course, he, he, he belongs to a certain tendency that insists on a rather uh, non-rational, as he puts it, or esoteric, uh, Gnostic traditions, which he argues um, punctuate the early Shia landscape and they form the original core of Shiism, mm. um, which he does very well. Just to identify, okay. sorry, so excuse me, I keep jumping in. Not all, Just to no. identify in case viewers don't don't know, this is Muhammad Ali Amir Muazzi, who's at yep. the Eco Pratique yep. Haute Etudes in, in Paris. Sorry, please. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and his ability to bring these traditions, um, sort of the early Hadith literature, the early Shi Hadith literature, in conversation with other late antique themes is, is also one of the main reasons um, why I, I sort of decided to follow in that spirit um, to bring early Shi'i themes in conversations with, 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 with late ancient strands of religion, theology, and philosophy. So at the moment, I'm working on an article um, which tries to reconstruct what the early Shi'i, the first in the first two Hijri centuries, thought about the question or thought about the issue of the soul. What did it mean to speak of the soul? what did it mean to be a human? Um, and I'm finding that, you know, many of the claims made by Amir Wise of the early Shia sources, um, sometimes oblivious to them. Um, this may have to do with the fact that 
So before, I mean, Shiism, Shia studies in the West um, became a subfield of Islamic studies around 1965 with a famous conference in, in Strasbourg, um, where people like Madeleine were present, Henry Corbin and, and others. Mm -hmm. um, before that, we sort of worked in the spirit of, of, of Gulzir, who famously uh, described Shiism as a Persian religiosity influenced by late ancient Neoplatonism and therefore unworthy of the scholar's attention or the modern Orientalist's attention. Um, and despite, of course, his great contributions um, towards Shia studies, um, Gulzir, it, it, seems that, yeah. it seems that a number of scholars working on early Islam continue to sort of inherit that Orientalist bias towards the study of Shia Islam. So Amir Wesley famously wrote, um, I think, 2011, 2012, um, if you are going to assume that Shia sources are biased and sectarian, and of course they are, they are highly uh, partial and, and, and you know, they do give us sectarian accounts of, of the early period, but so is every other Muslim source. They are all equally biased and, and um, lacking in, in, in impartiality. So why should you privilege one over the other? Um, and in some cases, Moazi argues, Shiism could give you accounts of the original formative period of Islam that others lack, primarily because Shiism was never, never under the caliphal dictates. It never had to conform mm. to state orthodoxy, it never had to placate or please or appease the author authorities. And because it was this marginal, small, um, not necessarily all the time, but because it was marginal and away from the majority, it, it never felt a need to sort of create or conform itself to the social and political mores of the time. Mm. Um, and, and that is quite useful for a historian of ideas. And that's a paradigm um, shift when so many introduction to Islam courses still are taught by introducing the prophet, the Quran, early Islamic history, and then you'll have a class, I don't know, three or four weeks into yeah. the semester on Shiism. Um, yeah, and I, I find that quite problematic. And of course, I, in many ways, I'm a sort of hypocritical myself because at Leiden, I, two years ago, three years ago, I taught a class called Introduction to Shia Islam. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped doing this because I, I thought it's not conducive to training students in Islamic studies. Um, to create the impression that Shiism can be sequestered and, and detached and separated. Um, early Shi'i ideas uh, are indebted in some ways to, to sort of non-Shi'i religiosities um, that later came to be known as Sunni Islam. And likewise, um, early Sunni ideas are indebted to non-Sunni religiosities that later came to be known as Shi'i Islam. And you find this in law, in Hadith, in Quranic uh, uh, exegesis and, and, and other areas. Um, Robert Lee, one of my um, former teachers at Exeter, has a fascinating study. I don't know if he's published it. He presented it as a paper in 2018, okay. um, where he shows how early Shia conceptions of um, one's position towards the state and whether one should obey a tyrannical state or a tyrannical ruler um, came to exert profound influence on the later development of Sunni legal theory. Um, in relation to the state and, and uh, a human's obligation towards the state. And one, one is certain that, you know, it works in both ways, you know, it cuts both ways. Um, there was a, a great deal of cross-pollination um, where ideas were intertwined. Um, you know, it's, it's remarkable to sort of, to try and separate that and, and assume that there were clear, demarcated, consolidated, sectarian identities from the early, early period. That is bizarre. You don't find, I mean, there's no such thing as Sunnism or Shiism in the way we understand it later, before the ninth century AD. It's, it's quite bizarre. Mm. Um, when you read the works, even in say the 10th century, 11th century, when you read the works of well-known um, imami theologians like uh, Sheikh al-Mufid, he doesn't, when he lists all the groups with whom he disagrees, he mentions the Mu'tazila, he mentions uh, a number of other groups, the, the, um, uh, the, the Hanabila and so on, but he never actually uses the word Sunni. He says al am which for, for a while we simply translated as Sunnis, but 
I think a literal rendering here would actually be more accurate. It simply meant the masses, mm -hmm. the masses who had yet to converge towards a clear-cut, consolidated sectarian identity, right? And even Shiism, it's a very nebulous term before the ninth century. It means sort of a number of things. There were Shi'is before the ninth century who identified as the true and the Sunnah and, and vice versa. Sunnism was a contested term of prestige. Everyone wanted it. Um, and it's, it's Everyone wanted made... to be and the Sunnah. Well, oh, well, yes, yes. But following you know, the Prophet's example, yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I would say, I mean, you sort of see this every time there's a standoff between Iran and Saudi Arabia, you know, with the ongoing geopolitical struggles. You see this in the sort of typical headline that follows suit is, um, this rivalry can be traced back to the ancient Shia Sunni um, schism. And that is absolutely nonsensical because the schism um, is quite early, yes, but the Shia Sunni division became clear cut only, in my view and many others, only after the maybe 10th, 11th century AD. Well, in light of that, and the strong case you make for the ongoing diversity within Islam and the cross-pollination between scholars we might think of as Shia and Sunni, uh, is it coherent then to speak in terms of the Quran as a distinctive Shia or Shiite engagement um, or exegetical mode or way of uh, interpreting, reading the text um, in, the early, in the early period? Um, obviously, there are works of exegesis or tafsir like Qummi, for example, which are really intent on finding proof texts for traditional yep. claims about the Imams, etc. Um, but I mean, beyond beyond that, uh, are there particular Shi ways of, of reading the text? Is that coherent to think in that in those terms? The nature of, of early Shi engagement with the Quran. <clears throat> Again, when I say Shi, what I really should be saying is, is proto Shiism. Mm. Um, in the same way, I, I speak of proto Sunnism um, in the period before the move towards canonization or the rise of orthodoxy, as, as some have put it. Um, so you do find a, a common modus operandi um, in terms of how the early proto shi figures, um, particularly the circles of, of the fifth and sixth Imam, Muhammad al-Baqir and Jafar al-Sadiq. The Sadiq, yes. How they came to identify or deal with the Quran. Um, one, as you noted, there was an attempt to find proof text um, that supported the Shi'i course. So the Quran came to be seen as a revelation that mapped out um, divine providence and the trajectory of history um, and forewarned people about the pitfalls and shortcomings that were to be committed by the followers of, of Muhammad after his death. So you find this constantly, an attempt to read into the Quran um, the early schismatic differences that arose after uh, the death of Muhammad in 632. Um, you find that some verses are interpreted as confirming uh, one's expected allegiance to the Imams. Uh, whenever verses speaks of things like al uh, or, or anything negative, they are immediately read as coded messages intent for, for, for certain historical figures, which Shi'is, or the early sort of proto Shi'is, came to hold in, in disdain. Uh, that is a well-known attested fact. Um, so the, the Quran became a text that um, contained messages which endorsed the family of the prophet and their right to inherit the mantle of, of prophecy, not to become prophets, but to inherit the mantle of leadership, um, and a text that um, elucidated um, the enemies who stood in firm opposition to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is what revelation is. That is the, the course of history. You either have wala or, or, or you show bara or, or, or you sort of you associate or dissociate right. from the friends of God or dissociate from the enemies of God. Yes. So, um, okay, I have two questions which arise immediately. One is, um, is it fair then to say that with this strain of exegetical thought, there's a particular concern for, for salvation history? So, other than deriving norms from the text that allow you that inform your practice and teaching, 
but actually um, allusions or references to what happened in human history, which was the unfolding of divine providence or a divine plan. Does that make sense? Is that coherent at all? <laughs> no, it's, it's perfectly coherent. Um, I, you're absolutely right. I would sort of completely agree with this. Um, surprisingly, aside from one or two, I know one, one well-known monograph which sort of traces the development of, of Shi'i tafsir uh, in medieval times. Um, that is an area which continues to be, remains understudied, um, primarily because questions such as the ones you've just addressed have yet to be answered or explored fully. But yes, I, I would say that is a correct assessment. Um, there is strong elements of salvation history there. There are strong elements or themes um, of the Quran intervene and, 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 and take an active role in these historical contingencies. Um, um, and I think that that's, that's clear. There is another tendency in Shi'i tafsir, which is completely sort of indifferent to that salvation, um, sectarian, theological reading of the Quran. Um, and this is a tendency that has been influenced um, by the Mu'tazili strand. Um, a tendency which insists on rational, um, theologically moderate or diluted readings of the Quran, a tendency which continues uh, until the present in some places like Iran. Within, within Shiism. Within Shiism, yes. 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 Yeah. Um, Maybe you know the work of my colleague here at Notre Dame, Hussein Abdul Sater. Um, Hussein Abdul Sater is, is on this, yes. exactly so his, his study of uh, uh, Sharif al Murtaba. Exactly. Um, is, is a perfect demonstration or, or sort of a, a good instance of the rational strand of Shiism that is somewhat indifferent and even critical of the other strand of Shiism that insists on sort of esoteric, Gnostic, uh, non-rational readings of the past, including the Quran. Um, there are instances in some early Shi'i tafsir, so usually we divide Shi'i tafsir to two sort of two subgenres before the Buyids and after the Buyids, because the Buyids uh, marked a watershed moment in, in the Shi'i uh, trajectory or Shi'i intellectual and religious history. Well, the Buyids, just to define for our, our viewers, and you'll have to correct me, I'm almost sure, but oh, no. it was in the Ir Iranian um, dynasty emirate. Uh, of course, the Abbasid Caliph is still there in Baghdad, who um, arise in the mid 10th century, I think, uh, and are there until the Seljuks come around 1060 something. Um, and have uh, divisions among themselves, I think, but they're controlling things in Iran and Iraq. Is that basically right? Yeah, and and broadly, um, the Buyids were, were quite tolerant, um, but very broadly, they associated with a strand of Shiism, which we later came to identify as Zaydism. Um, so they, they gave patronage to Shi'i scholars, Twelvers, um, Zaydis, um, and because of that, um, Shiism was now felt, it felt a need to present itself as state worthy, a religion that could be worthy of an empire, uh, which was seeking to project power and prestige. And hence there was a move towards rationalization. That is at least the standard narrative. Um, so in the before or pre boya period, you find um, Shi readings of the Quran which I've, as I've mentioned, which associate almost every negative derogatory verse with the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. Um, I won't repeat them here because some of them are quite explicit. Um, but yeah, you, you get a gist of, of, of what I mean. Yeah, and then the other question that occurred to me uh, is, uh, I mean, just particular cases, some which involve variant readings of Quranic verses, um, so, I mean, the two that come to mind, I'm sure you, there, there are many others, maybe more interesting ones than this, but uh, Quran uh, Surah 3, Al-Imran, verse 7, is a famous sort of crux of study uh, uh, about um, how the Quran can be divided between mutashabihat uh, and muhkamat, so ambiguous and clear verses, but there's that famous bit there where um, either um, the uh, the interpretation of the text is known only to God or also a rasikhuna fil al yeah, so yeah, firmly yeah. grounded in knowledge. So you can punctuate that in different ways. Yeah, and then there's yeah. the reference to the best the best of communities, the yeah, Arabic yeah. word there being umma, which I think actually produces a variant reading, or I don't know the right way to put it, um, yeah. for Shiites, that it's a imma there, not umma. Meaning some readings, umma. yes, some readings uh, is, is, is uh, imma, uh, 
Um, likewise, uh, in Pombi, for example, so top of my head, um, I can't remember which verse, but uh, which chapter of it's. Um, the, the ayah reads, هذا صراط على مستقيم وعلي مستقيم. The Ummi reads it, or at least acknowledges one reading that says, هذا صراط علي مستقيم. This is the path of Ali that is straight. Mm. Um, so you get sort of a, a number of these variant readings well into the ninth, perhaps even 10th century AD. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I sort of decided to, to write a chapter on this or an article on this, um, because it seems to me that at least in some Shia circles, the Quran had yet to reach a canon or, or sort of a stable status um, after two or three centuries, um, mm -hmm. after which it was, of course, um, supposedly um, compiled and canonized or collected. And I find that very interesting. There's a book which um, has has survived in, in, in a relatively early manuscript uh, copy, uh, Kitab al Qiraat by Al Sayyari, um, where even verses or chapters which we take for granted as, as chapters that uh, converge towards stability and canonization, even those chapters are sort of contested. Um, and that's really fascinating. But you'll have to um, read the article when it comes out. Okay, okay, got it, got it. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if, if there's a, a smooth segue to get from this discussion of early tafsir and exegesis to the mushrikun of the Quran. Oh, yeah. So I'm not going to attempt one. I'm just going to uh, shift um, abruptly to speaking about the mushrikun, which is, of course, um, one of your current, current projects and... Um, can I ask, how did you get interested in the first place in thinking about the identity of the, the so-called uh, pagans and maybe you want to comment on that term pagan if it's the right term to use? Um, yeah. So, um, well, um, I, I think studies on early Islam um, have two shortcomings. Um, one is there's the assumption that the move towards theological and religious stabilization came early. And I don't think that's the case. Um, recent studies, for example, by someone like Shahab Ahmed um, in, in his, not his, what is Islam, which um, is, is different, um, on the satanic verses. Yes, yes. Um, showed us that. Published posthumously of- uh, Yeah, his, his Princeton yeah. University Press. I think that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, where he sort of, I thought, demonstrated quite well um, that the theory of doctrine of prophecy did not uh, acquire stability in the first two or three centuries. It, it took two or three centuries before it could sort of settle down and, and, and be accepted um, in its entirety um, that we would later recognize in, in, in sort of the later periods. Um, and this is how he accounted for, you know, readily, some people readily accepting um, certain sort of narratives about the prophet and his reception of the revelation um, and the whole incident of the satanic verses, uh, which, which challenge the, the orthodox position that sort of settled down or emerged after the ninth century. So the point is, I, I suppose, one of the shortcomings is we often um, ignore the fact that before the third, fourth century Hijri or, or, or ninth century, ninth, tenth century uh, Gregorian, um, the intellectual landscape, intellectual and religious landscape of Islam was diverse, multiple, and nowhere near full um, stability, the full stability that we associate with, with the later period. Um, the second shortcoming is, is what sort of prompted me to study the pagans is in almost every introductory work on Islam, and there are obvious exceptions, there's very little, if any, reference to the religiosity of the so-called so pagans, the mushrikun of the Quran. We know very little about the worldview, the religiosity, the legal and moral commitments, um, the influences, the customs, and so on. Um, that is you know, conspicuously absent. Um, in, in the sources, the secondary literature. Um, mm. So that, that was one of the reasons what, why I decided to sort of embark on this second monograph, which um, at the 
moment is tentatively titled Monotheism and Paganism in the Quran or in late antique Arabia. And the aim is, is simply to reconstruct the religious um, worldview of the pagans using the Quran and other contemporary sources. And I work with the assumption that the Quran is, is a seventh century source that almost perfectly encapsulates seventh century mentalities and moods and outlooks. Um, and obviously it's, it's a work in progress. Um, it will take me maybe another two years uh, to finish uh, the project. But I, I, I have, of course, um, already come to some very interesting tentative conclusions. Um, the most interesting of which is, as has already been sort of some that was already stated by a reporting, is the idea of idol worship is, is, is seems to be exaggerated. Mm. Idol worship during the time of, of Muhammad or seventh century Mecca around the, sort of the sanctuary. I suspect that was quite exaggerated. Interesting. When you read the tradition, you, you, you know, you, you find, for example, in, in some of the Sira accounts, um, as, as, as much as 360 or 365, or, you know, the numbers vary, gods or idols in, in, in Mecca, in, in the Kaaba itself, or around the vicinity. But a close reading of the Quran shows that, you know, just to sort of quote, I have this, just some notes here, this wonderful quote by Patricia um, about um, the idols uh, in the Quran, where, where she says something like, something is amiss because, I can't seem to find it, but anyhow, um, the Quran seems to be quite silent on whether the contemporaries of Muhammad, whether the majority of the contemporaries of Muhammad actually engaged in idol worship. It's very interesting. There's no doubt that the Quran mentions idols by name, right? Mm -hmm. that, that is clear. But um, it is, seems uh, asnam being the key word here. Is it asnam more than Authan? Well, it mentions specific names like, you know, uh, um, Allah, for example, these are the typical names. And, and the asnam, of course, is also used. Um, but it seems that whenever a specific detailed account of idol worship is mentioned, that seems to refer to a distant biblical mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. so Not Ab Abraham's context, maybe. Or exactly. Noah, Abraham, and, and other contexts also speaks of, of a certain people. Or nations, for example, some astral worship, but very, very rarely. Um, there's also a great work that was published in 1977 by a Spanish scholar called Javier Tixador. Tixador. Um, let's see if I can find the title here, the, the Pagan God. And what he argues is that from around the fourth century, fifth century AD maybe, there was a move in, in the region, in, in what we now call the Middle East, in the Mediterranean world, towards practical monotheism, right? And that seems to concur with the inscription accounts, uh, with the epigraphic evidence, because we struggle to find epigraphic evidence in the region that point towards idol worship or polytheism after the fifth century, right? That's not to say they're not there. We may discover them one day. I, I remember having this conversation with, with sort of the doyen of, of, of this stuff, Ahmed, Ahmed Jalad. And I think we were in broad agreement that it, it, that seems to be true. That seems to be the case that the evidence doesn't point towards polytheism or any form of, of associationism or shirk in Arabia after 425 AD, the early fifth century. And, and again, there's much evidence, um, epigraphic evidence, literary evidence that seem to suggest um, that is the case. So for example, what I decided to do, what I'm doing now is I managed to collate all the verses in the Quran that speak or make reference to the Mushrikun or anything to do with Arabian religiosity at the time of Muhammad. Okay. Um, and I have around 400, around 400. And with that, I thought, okay, now time to see if I can create or reconstruct the worldview um, in relation to things like, did they have a pseudo or, or, or semi-legal moral code? Did they have a theology-like commitment? Did they have customs? Did they deal with legal matters? 
Um, and I, I will list them for you here. I, I sort of just read them from my notes. Okay. So we find the the pagans, which of course, as you know, um, was a term of abuse um, in, in late antiquity by Christians directed at non-Christians in the countryside. Um, but when one deals with the famous late antique um, polemics between Greek philosophers and Christian thinkers. Um, sometimes it was the other way around. It was the Greek philosophers who accused the Christians of being pagan worshippers mm. and polytheists. Mm. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the term, and I was going to come to this, but the term sort of monotheism is a very late construct. Um, in English, at least, it's, I don't think we can which can trace it back maybe to the 17th century with, with sort of well-known Cambridge Platonists like Henry Moore and others. Um, and, and, and it has been argued by someone like Henry Moore that the term monotheism was super added to an already definable religion, right? So it was a term of prestige. And one could also argue the same in, in the same case of Tawheed. Um, you don't really find that um, in the Quran in, in, it, in its current form. So collating all these 400 verses about the Mushrikun, I found that generally as a group, and I will of course show or hope to argue that there were multiple strands or layers of shirk or paganism in Arabia at the time of Muhammad. But generally a good portion of it believed in God. They believed that there was someone who created the heavens and the earth, one sovereign Lord. They believed he's the sender of rain, as uh, Nick Lice and I famously argued, he was an Arabic uh, pre-Islamic poetry. He was a lawgiver. He had dominion over the cosmos. He was the source of strength and protection. He answers prayers. In legal matters, they also had a measure of haram and halal, using those very specific terms. They Can I ask that about, about the, sorry to th throw off your momentum there, but on, on the first question of the conceptions about Allah, uh, um, of course, you've written on this as well. Well, uh, a, a bit on Allah, but not not so much on the pagan engagement with with Allah. And you know, as 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 you allude to, there are many passages in which the Quran says, "Well, if you ask the mushrikun who created the heavens and the earth, they'll say Allah." Do, do you have a sense over whether the when they when the mushrikun thought of Allah, uh, mm -hmm. did they associate that with the God of the Jews and Christians of a of a, of well, a, I was coming to this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I was coming to. But I think the verse he mentioned, "Wali and Wali and man khalaq al samawati wal ardi wa sakhara al shams wal qamar liyakulun Allah." Right. If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth um, and set the, the the sort of these celestial objects in motion, they would say God. Um, the Quran says even when they sort of set in the sea and 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 when they sort of turn towards God in sincerity, but when they come back to land, then they return to their associationism. But in, in, in my attempt to try and reconstruct this worldview, so we've mentioned their belief in God. Um, they had a notion, you know, even sort of illegal matters. They had a notion of halal and haram, which as I've mentioned, the Quran speaks of uh, um, a legal or moral code they had where they held certain crops as sacrosanct. Mm. Um, they had dietary restrictions, mm. right? Um, they believed in supernatural um, entities, um, which the Quran is very critical of. That is one of the main, perhaps the chief critical or criticism directed at them by the Quran. Their belief in lesser deities and dad, the Quran calls them. They believed in intercession, ancestral worship. They believed in other cosmologies, such as gems and demons. Um, some of them, the Quran says, denied bodily resurrection. Others did not. Some of them had a conception of this world and otherworldliness. Um, they had a theology-like outlook. So some of them believed in determinism. They said these actions of ours have already been predetermined, so why should we sort of change them? A few of them, as the Quran attests, also believe in the notion of miracles or probative proofs one brings forward, right? A Burhan-like, clear proof. Yes, evidentiary um, miracles, or Yes. Yeah, they also believe, for example, in worship and, and specifically in worship in, in, in a certain way that brings them closer to God. They had prayer-like or ritual-like customs. They believed in sacred space. They believed in the performance of prayer. They practiced Hajj. Um, Julius Wellhausen famously argued that one of the most palpable, clear-cut 
vestiges of, of Arabian paganism in early Islam is the Hajj, right? right? Um, they gave sacrifices, animal sacrifices. In some cases, they would slit the ears of, of the animals in a certain way because they thought that was a, a sacred practice. They believed in child killing as an act of religiosity. They prayed for healthy children. They made vows. They also believed in pious example. In, in a few instances when Muhammad is sort of engaging with them, they say, but we found our ancestors on this path, right? That is sort of the, the custom, the practice of the ancestors, oh, yes. right? Um, and in terms, you know, of, of, of um, angels, recognition of angels, some of them worshipped the angels, some of them thought angels were daughters of God, and so on. So with this, what I'm sort of suggesting is that there were at least four layers of paganism or shirk in Arabia. And these were the main interlocutors of Muhammad in the Quran. The very high sort of, um, to quote, I, I can't remember who said this, but it's, it's someone who doesn't work on Islam, but works in Christianity or, or late ancient uh, Christianity. He, he defines this as sophisticated polytheism. So I call it high paganism, right? If we think of sort of a, a pyramid-like uh, shape, and these are the ones who believe in God as, as the rain giver, creator of the heavens and the earth, uh, the one who answers prayers and so on, the supreme God. Um, Montgomery Watt famously termed this, um, the sort of Arabian humanism or, or the, the, the Allah as, as sort of the um, uh, high, high, high practice of, of, of monotheism inflected with some uh, associationism. So below, below, high, uh, below high paganism, um, I had identified another layer or another sort of subgroup among the Mushrikun, which I call this worldly paganism. These were the folk that de denied resurrection, um, and, and these are the people who denied um, sort of the hereafter. Um, there was a case, for example, um, where Patricia Crone famously uh, wrote on this, and, and she analyzed a number of verses where the, the, the pagans, um, in rejecting Muhammad as a messenger, they didn't reject him on the principle that God sends messengers. They simply said, in our conception, God sends angels as messengers, mm. not humans, mm. right? And that led me to believe, of course, well, where did they get this idea from that God communicates with humanity through angels? Very interesting point. Right, and here, of course, no. one clearly point towards Jewish and Christian influences, mm. at least, Mm. You know, survivals of that mm. at the very the verses which speak about uh do you find it scandalous that a man like yourself who walks around in the market and eats could be yeah 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 because their idea of a, of a messenger was someone who's supposed to be very elevated and i think they would say something like this is how moses or, or the teachings of moses have come down to us something mm -hmm. to that because he's in the heavenly realm when he meets with god at mount sinai he actually enters into the yeah. heavenly realm according to some jewish conceptions mm -hmm. At the very bottom of this pile are what I would most certainly recognize as idol worshippers. Mm -hmm. And there are sort of uh, uh, references to them um, in the Quran. Um, but at the very high end of this are their sort of uh, high paganism. Um, and it seems to me at the moment there is, I would say, it, it was suggested by some, by like Patricia and others, that there's a tension in the Quran between the very high, idealized, abstract, radical monotheism that you find in the Quran on the one hand. On the other hand, the Quran's acknowledgement of a wider, broader cosmology that permits the existence of angels and demons and prophets, and, and, and it, it permits practices such as intercession with certain uh, provisos. And I'm trying to sort of account or reconcile this seam intention and that's why I, I sort of have given it's a tentative title, yes. monotheism and um, paganism. Um, Henry Moore, who I mentioned earlier, would, would sometimes say that monotheism, and just to sort of read from the notes, became an intelligent and a demarcated category after religion became defined as a set of beliefs. So sometimes impose a super added um, on religion. Um, there are some sort of example for those um, who sort of want specific references. There's quite too many here, but I will read one which I found fascinating. Um, and this is 
um, a verse that reads, um, O believers, do not violate Allah's rituals of pilgrimage, the sacred month, the sacrificial animals, the offerings decor decorated with the necklace, right? Al Qala'id. Um, nor those pilgrims on their way to the sacred house seeking the Lord's bounty and pleasure, and so on. And that sort of put in um, a necklace yes, yes. around sacrificial animals. That's the animals. Because you find that when, when you sort of read the work of, of someone like John um, Haley, uh, who wrote on the Nabataean religion, yes, um, you find references like that in the late ancient Mediterranean um, religiosities. Um, there's another example which I thought was fascinating, and it has rarely been studied or acknowledged. Um, and this is when the Quran speaks, um, I think it's um, Al Ma'idah, uh, chapter three or two. Um, I don't have the reference, I just have the Arabic, um, where it says, when you slaughter your animals, don't sort of stop this practice of placing them on sacrificial stones, nusul. Mm -hmm. Right don't, and st don't stop the practice. No, stop that practice. Stop it, it, stop it, was, yeah. The Quran was sort of criticizing this yeah. this pagan practice. So what they would do um, is they would sort of slaughter the animals, and they would get their blood and smear it on these slabs or stones, mm -hmm. because they sort of had adopted a position which most probably emerged from the sort of the, the Nabataean uh, uh, mood of religiosity, whereby God cannot be represented by images, but he can occupy the space on a flat stone, right? And the Quran calls this nusab, right? Mm -hmm. And they seem to have to do that. And that's interesting because there's a Hebrew uh, antecedent to that, masabat um, okay. uh, in Hebrew, where that sacrificial stone was also con believed to contain in sort of ancient Israel, um, the spirit of the gods. And therefore you smeared your blood there as a sacrificial um, votive, way to draw near to God. And the Quran seems to sort of say, stop doing this. And that seems to be taking place in Arabia at the time of, of Muhammad. Yes. Um, so there's and, and that, a tension between what we find in the inscriptions, which suggest, well, at least it's an argument from silence, but don't give us uh, evidence, at least for uh, uh, polytheism in, in the later fifth and sixth centuries. And the Quran itself seem, seems to reflect ongoing practices with the necklaces and the sacrificial stones and um, yeah. uh, dedicating certain parts of your crops um, to, yeah. to the gods and, yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so the one way uh, I, I sort of realized that, that this cannot be referring to one group, because on the one hand, you have folk in Arabia, some of Muhammad's interlocutors, who seem to be relatively sophisticated for 7th century um, Arabs who, you know, uh, as the sources describe them, um, they believed in God, that he has dominion, and so on. And on the other hand, they would do something so clearly and, and patently paganistic. Um, I find yeah. it difficult to believe that this is this one is the group. same group. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and which is why I speak of sort of different oh, that's, layers. It's a really important insight. You know, I, I show my students sometimes, I don't know if you know the film, The Message by the Jordanian yep. uh, director, Mustafa Akkad. Yes. Um, yeah, so the opening scene there is really great for presenting sort of the standard idea about the idolatrous pagans of Mecca at the, at the dawn of Islam. And you mentioned the smearing of blood on a stone, but right in the opening scene, there's a picture of pagans who are bringing in their idol to the Kaaba. The Quraysh are really happy, more gods for the Kaaba. Um, exactly. And more profit for us. And they're smearing blood on the idols, not on stones, yep. actually, but on the idols. And yes. Well, interesting. So you mentioned idols, but even, even the famous account uh, of, of Kitab al Aslam by um, Ibn al Kelbi, okay. yes. early, early 9th century. He only actually mentions two idols in Arabia at the time of Muhammad, okay. um, or two gods that were had statues or, or sort of carved in the form of an idol. Yes. Um, I think it's um, Wed and and uh, Hobel, right? Only those two gods were has sort of given idol form, um, and that sort of fits in with with, with what Sporting is saying. And I'm trying to argue that idol worship, no doubt, it was there. I think it was greatly exaggerated by the tradition. And I think for good reason, and, and I mentioned this in, in my talk at Oxford, um, I think last January, um, 
it's it's better to depict in terms of, of sort of literary um, depictions of, of the mission of Muhammad. It's better to depict him as someone who was revolutionary in his fight against um, rampant idol worship than the picture, which I think was closer to the truth, as someone who simply came to reform mm. <clears throat> the monotheistic tendencies which existed among some Arabs. Mm. Um, because all the evidence seems to suggest that the region had already become acquainted with some forms of monotheism, from Judaism, Christianity, Nabataean religions, um, and, and other instances. We already, could, for example, can identify the cult of Ar-Rahman in, in South Arabia. Right. Um, recent studies have also argued that Ar-Rahman, the cult of Ar-Rahman could perhaps be of a more northern uh, provenance in Syria. But nevertheless, it's still a cult of one God. Yes. It's still a cult which distant itself from polytheism. And the Quran, of course, famously, uh, famously uh, validates or affirms the use of Ar-Rahman as yep. a divine name. You know, call, on, call on Allah or call on whatever name you call him to him are yep. the beautiful names yes yep. um maybe i can get in one more question i think i've tried your patience but i did want to ask uh, no, no, uh, i don't know if you have thoughts on this but uh mushrikun is this a pejorative title that the quran gives to uh the 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 i don't know how to refer to them now the pagans um or it, could it be something that anyone would adopt for themselves um and if so, uh, is there any way of thinking what their self-identification might be? I, I think the Mushrikun um, have been depicted by an, a great number of sources as, as the really nasty bad guys. Um, and in some ways, they've never really had an opportunity to defend themselves. Um, uh, I often think, and, and I'm sort of following in the footsteps of some colleagues here, had it not been for the success of Islam, no one would really care about the pre-Islamic uh, Arabian religion that existed at the time of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. But people are eager and, and keen to contrast. Um, Horting is of the belief that the Quran over um in its engagement or dialogue with the Mushrikun. Mm -hmm. And he thinks, he has argued that the Quran sometimes uh, presents them or depicts them unfairly. Um, in a sort of a typical late antique polemic. Um, in the same way, we see similar attempts to try and de belittle, reduce to an absurdity, the views of, of Christians in the writings of Greek philosophers. Um, so Horting points to the reference in the Quran, which reduces the, the religion of the, the Hajj of the Mushrikun to clapping and singing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and he thinks, he has argued that this is an unfair um, characterization because when I, again, when you deal with the Talbiyas, uh, I'm also surprised this is something that hasn't been done. So as you know, when Muslims perform the Hajj, um, when they do the Tawaf, um, they read certain invocations um, which sort of mark the moment when the pilgrim um, enters into a state of temporary um, consecration, right, Ihram. Um, and what I've managed to do is to collect all the pre-Islamic Talbiyas um, of Quraysh and tribes associated with them or around the vicinity, which survive in, in the very early Tafasir. Um, and I'll read you some. So, for example, uh, Muqatil bin Sulaiman, who died in, in 700, 8th century, has actually preserved at least 50 Talbiyas of the pre-Islamic Arabs some of them read in a way that clearly lends credence to this argument that there were, there were very clear traces of monotheism among them, where they would say, la bayk Allahumma la bayk la sharika la la bayk. Right? That sounds <laughs> like... That, that doesn't sound like a mushrik to say la sharika no. la <laughs> Right? Others would say, la bayk Allahumma hajjan haqban. Right? Um, and true, so a on. A true um, pilgrimage or a valid pilgrimage. A true pilgrimage. Yeah. Um, some of them, and, and this could be, of course, a later addition, but you find it in, um, in, in some of the tribes, like um, in Quraysh, um, until they say, and Nasara dinaha. right? That's, you know, so we, we sort of come to you, pay homage to you, in order to oppose this religion of the Nasara. And that, I suspect, is a late addition. But nevertheless, there are um, early Tenbiyas. Um, 
which would show that um, this, this notion of monotheism is certainly not new, at least um, not in its general outlines. What I do think is true is that the Quran does introduce a radical notion of monotheism that did not sit well with the pagans mm -hmm. because they wanted sort of a, 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 a more a laxer cosmology, mm -hmm. right? Not a strict um, monotheistic um, outview, uh, outlook on the world. And, and just in terms of the name, very last final <laughs> question, in terms of the name Mushrikun or El Adina Ashiraku, I, I, I assume this is not something they would have called themselves. Um, no. It's a label the Quran puts on them. If you were neither a Jew nor a Christian, but maybe on this high category in your, your classification of four different types of the Mushrikun, um, it, it's hard to know what term they would have used for themselves. Or, or do you have a thought about that? Honestly, honestly Gabriel, that, that's really difficult um, to sort of to say um, conclusively. Um, Given, given sort of the problematic nature of the sources right, we're dealing right. with. Yeah, uh, I still don't that, have an idea. <laughs> given the polemical nature of the, some of the sources we're dealing with, um, one term, I, 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 not, I mean, that, that I will try and of course um, uh, explore is, is Hanif, um, and whether that was a, a, a recognizable self-appellation is, is something that I, I honestly don't know um, at this stage. It's also worth remembering or mentioning before we sort of ask about what they refer to themselves, you know, would that have been a, a normal practice for people to describe them, to describe their worldview, their rituals, their commitments in a singular term? Um, in ancient, the ancient notion of religion, you find among the Greeks and, and others, didn't really care for these strict labels. They cared for rituals and devotions. That was the most sort of defining feature of, of what we would later call religion. But there are instances in the Quran where the word deen is used. And that is also interesting because we find that the word does have a precedent in, in Syriac and in Hebrew and in Pahlavi. Um, Dayana, for example, in, in Syriac, uh, for Dain or Dan in Hebrew, um, which it didn't necessarily mean religion. It, it often meant things like the legal opinion, a judgment. Um, Pahlavi is perhaps the closest equivalent um, to, to sort of religion understood in the Islamic parlance. Interesting, wonderful. Well, it, it's really uh, fascinating to see this more nuanced uh, presentation of, um, of the Quranic pagans or the, the Mushrikun. And I think um, it, it makes marks a profound shift um, in uh, the image that uh, I show my students from the movie The Message, <laughs> mm. but was also really uh, you know widespread and diffused uh, in scholarly literature as well. This simplistic vision of these you know idolatrous um, yep. pagans and um, uh, thank you for for making my things pleasure. more more complicated but much more interesting. So yeah, my wonderful pleasure. speaking with you. I have, thank you for your time. I thank hope you so we'll be a part two at some point. Yeah. It will be my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, okay. I hope we meet soon in person. Likewise. Thank you. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos, starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.